uh, Anakara, my colleague from, is, is, is this on? Yes. Uh, uh, Anakara and I, I'm from Anakara from Oberlin College, and myself, Robert Barron, New York State Council on the Arts, we're, we're thrilled to be here uh, interviewing that most elusive and uh, subjects with his uh, hi highly protein uh, interests, high protein, uh, John Schwed of uh, Ivy League trifecta, trifecta, Yale, Columbia, and that John, ins you institution this near the Schuylkill. <laughs> uh, and uh, for everyone who was here yesterday, I, I think we, we saw John's deep and wide learning, his, um, his uh, improvisatory and playful uh, view of knowledge, and, and his, uh, the way he's able to bring ideas from um, seemingly disjunct realms together and, and create new kinds of syntheses, syntheses. Uh, John uh, was a jazz musician for a number of years. Do you still play, John? No. Occasionally? In your, in your, in your mind, right in your head. It ends badly. <laughs> it's, like, it's like what Dylan said when someone said, you know you're a poet now, and he said, no, you wind up killing yourself or in a lake. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, like, a, like a great improviser, uh, John will sort of work his way into John will work his way into the, into a into a theme. Uh, he'll uh, can we have a little silence, please. We'll we'll, uh, we'll improv. Uh, he'll work his way into a theme. He'll imp he'll improvise. He'll uh, he might wander a little bit and uh, but will uh, and then return to the do riff, return to the theme. And uh, there'll be something new and different that, that comes out of it. And uh, sometimes when you, you think you might have lost them for a few seconds, it comes back to it. And the ideas, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the ideas linger for many years, for decades. Um, and uh, Anna and I were um, both privileged to be students of John at the, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. We um, delighted in the white canvas bag. He'd brought, bring to class and uh, bring this bag and he'd say, what do you say, Anna? Get a load of this. As he, as he pulled out books. Get a load of this. And then he'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, not this one. And you know, he'd say, I forgot. And, and he'd say, this is good shit. You gotta pay attention to it. Read this. And John uh, also, as we know, has um, it's been way ahead of his time in so many ways in, in, in his ideas and his scholarship and his writing, uh, introducing uh, when very few, if any, anthropologists did reflexive, critically reflexive writing, uh, writing culture in effect, multiple modes of writing, um, a uh, penetrating critique of the culture of poverty, um, new insights in African American culture, and uh, you know, remarkable syntheses from different, different fields in, in, in an ongoing way. Uh, he introduced us to uh, cultural studies in, in the late 70s, uh, and when there was a symposium in honor of J John at, at Yale, um, I said, uh, you know, John, we read Raymond Williams and Hoggart and Birmingham School of Cultural Studies, and this was in the late 70s before anybody was doing cultural studies. And John said, yeah, we should have, uh, this is a voice in the back of the room, yeah, we should have strangled the, the little darling in its crib. So, so uh, John also has been, sure, I and, and I must say, continues to be uh, brilliantly attuned with a BS radar. He he sort of knows about uh, academic uh, fluff and and uh, detritus and and nonsense, and he sees through it and uh, very lucidly, and he's able to capture uh, new ideas from many different realms. So uh, I guess Anna will begin the conversation. We're going to touch on various dimensions of, um, of John's uh, career and, and our own experience with him. Uh, and uh, issues like uh, writing, his various modes of writing, the way he writes, uh, the culture of poverty and, and African-American expressive culture, the power of it, the uh, collaboration with other scholars, uh, learning from Lomax, so the, the, uh, the uh, magisterial biography that he did and other writings, uh, past and, and present. So, Anna. Well, um, I want to pick up on, on John's writing. Um, and I remember when we were at Penn, uh, John would always say how he's not writing enough. You know, he just wasn't writing enough. And now, when we look back on everything he's written, it's, it's extraordinary. 
Um, the difference was that John wasn't necessarily writing straight up articles, but um, infusing all kinds of genres and critical thought with, um, uh, with scholarship that uh, uh, was addressed not only to academics, but to the public at large. Um, as we heard last night, you know, journalism, art, music, dance reviews, liner notes, biography, radio, the works. Um, so it, it's placed him, um, at least in, in our conversation with Robert, in this position of public intellectual. Um, and I would add to that also art critic, advocate, uh, bohemian, and yes, maybe even hipster. Um, in the and, old sense, please. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, there is only one sense. <laughs> so in, in his role um, in, uh, in these various um, uh, areas, um, uh, as I said, we're struck with how he was able to inf um, infuse scholarship with his writing. And, and I'd like to ask John if he could talk about his writing process and um, uh, why the choices he made to use the different venues of the different genres, the w different ways of communicating ideas, and sort of what condition the choices. Well, that's an easy question, but I will say so far what you've heard is It's I, only the beginning, John. So far what you've heard is I came to class unprepared. <laughs> I blew away great ideas because I couldn't figure out what to do with them. And I had trouble finding identity. I have some notes here, by the way. <laughs> well, the first, the first thing is um, I found academic writing very hard. I found it hard to read, which was right. And it was, um, and I could see there was, after a while, I could see there was a trendiness to it. You had to keep up with it. Uh, it wasn't easy to do. When I went, to, I had been writing a lot, to jump ahead, when I was writing um, a lot of journalism, and I went to Yale, I was way ahead of the students on, on music and taste. I could, I could ask them about things they had no idea what I was talking about. I, I said, you know, my favorite record of the year is the, um, I can't think of her name. Um, it's a dance record called um, The Homecoming Queen's Got a Gun. And um, I thought, this is easy. I could do this. But it was hard to keep up. It was really hard. I, you know, I, I fall asleep a couple weekends and they've, the punks have turned into new romantics. And, People are not wearing bloody shirts anymore. They're wearing um, Edwardian clothes, Victorian clothes. Anyway, I found um, writing hard to do, hard to read, hard to keep up with. And, uh, I'd done journalism in college and published some things. I, once was at, I was once in a girly magazine called um, Encounter, which sounds kind of stupid, except Jack Kerouac was in there. So. Um, <laughs> Good and it, and it, well, it was an embarrassing piece he wrote called All the Boys Go Home for Thanksgiving. I told you all you need to know about Jack in a way, but um, so uh, that, um, I guess there were two things. It was easier for me to write and they paid. And years and years later, and I think it was within the last couple of years, there was an article by a historian in um, uh, Chronicle of Higher Education where he says, the headline at least said, Academics who write for free are schmucks. And I thought, yeah, well, I figured that out, but, uh, but by necessity. The other thing was I got things turned down. The first thing I wrote, which I stuck into a book crossovers, is because it got turned down. It's not very good, that's not the point. It's, it, it was turned down with no comment by uh, Bruno Nettle, who then said later, I didn't understand what you were saying. But it got accepted by Phylon, which was W.E.B. Du Bois' magazine. Was it? Who needs Bruno? I mean, who needs this stuff? I mean, I'd rather be, you know, in that scene. So they understood what I was talking about. It's not that great again, but there was that. Um, the Civil Rights Movement came along, and, and the first thing I noticed was that the academic, well, it wasn't the first thing. It came clear to me later. They were 10 years at least behind before there was any article anywhere to check me out on this. It's maybe even more than 10 years. They just didn't get the whole society moving right in front of them. It may still be like that. I don't know. It is? Ooh. Well, I mean, who needs that? And you could see, uh, and, and if you went to the meetings, it was like that too. Now. Um, 
I could int introduce here, what does my note say? Folklore. <laughs> it looked to me like it was a, a meeting of anthropology, arts, culture, maybe even arts and science, maybe all of these at once. And I thought, maybe mm, this looks interesting. It doesn't look like it's gonna be a, a kind of thing. And, uh, um, I'll confess that I really didn't get proverbs and, and <laughs> riddles and things for a long time, even with Roger's excellent work. And so I just didn't see why you'd wanna do that. It seemed to me it's like a small potatoes or something. But I really missed that. I mean, I, I was reading it wrong. Back to writing. Um, somewhere along the way, oh, yeah, this is what happened. I saw the Village Voice was running at high speed at that point. They had really great writers, just like Rolling Stone did. They were amazing writers, doing all kinds of stuff. Many of them were becoming screenwriters and what have you. And I thought, well, I'll give a try of this. So I sent a letter to Bob Criscow, who was the music editor, and said, I wanted to try this. And he called me back and said, um, um, you can't do that because this is a neighborhood newspaper, which it originally was, and you don't live in New York. And I said, well, I know for a fact that some of the people you publish regularly don't live in New York. Like who? Um, Michael Goodwin, who wrote about New Orleans, right? And so on. So I named three or four names. Well, that's different. They're personal friends of mine. <laughs> I said, all right, I'll become your personal friend. He said, but you're not living in New York. I said, I'll move to New York. What do you want? And he said, we're not getting anywhere. So he hangs up. And then when he went on leave, John Perellis, at the Times, somehow assumed his job. And Perellis wrote me and said, well, I write something. And I did. And then time went by, and I got a call from Chris Gow saying, I see you went behind my back while I was on vacation. I said, you know, a guy called me up and offered me this job. And he said, well, let's not talk about it. If you, since you've done it already, you might as well keep writing. Welcome to New York. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that started that, and um, I became this freelancer, but I published a lot of stuff, and I found out that, that I could make um, folklore work. I have an article on nostalgia, which I'm still proud of. Um, I forget what it was called, and what's, what set it off. Yeah, Shaka Khan, unless that's a, unless that's a, a representative from Pennsylvania, I forget, Shaka Khan? Sure, she was a singer. And, Shaka Khan is right. <laughs> and Check. Carly Simon. They had done two albums of show tunes, and I was appalled by this. So I got to thinking about, how can I write about this without just being nasty? And I thought I could talk about nostalgia. Folk is about nostalgia, right? And I think I opened it by saying that, um, I wish I had my book. We got it there? Yeah, give me that. You know, you, you lose your ability to write this stuff, so you have to go back to it. What's it called? As it's prophesied, so it used to be. That's it. This comes right after one called The Lizards Fake the Fake, and after Ellie Greenwich's Good Gnosis. Hmm. Whatever the daylight ruts of la vie quotidienne, at night America dreams pluralistically. In Dade County, Florida, Cubans wash off the grid of the land of cream. That I had the magazine cream there, and, you know, and honey fried chicken, and sleep in the memories of Matanzas and Havana. In Chester County, Pennsylvania, DuPont executives escape the stench of Delaware's plants to dream of 17th century America, a dream which spills over into their weekend whimsies of raising strange breeds of cattle, riding in ancient ox carts, and patronizing their local visuals man, Andrew Wyeth. And by the way, Dan Rose at this time found out that these same executives had gotten the government to purify the water, which runs down into the DuPont plant in the other state. Nice move, huh? You clean up your own backyard and your business makes more money. In all the counties of America, the dreaming goes on, taking its material shape in airport folk art gift shops, only shows, Victorian dollhouses, theme parks, Ethan Allen furniture, folk look fashion, Greco Tudor diners. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were real. All exercises in the aesthetics of crypto memory, the raising of the dead from the back of the collective mind. In a word, nostalgia, a social disease. And then I went into discussing nostalgia as a home. Uh, this is for real, you know this, right? That's, it was a disease that was first identified by the French in the 1700s. And it turns out it was in the gray book of, of psychiatric diseases for a long time. Right? 
French physician turned the emotion of homesickness into an illness by renaming it and formalizing its symptoms, much as love sickness had previously been turned into melancholia. This is not bad. I said, <laughs> <laughs> what had begun as a problem of Swiss travelers and soldiers missing local milk, the Alps, and folk songs became a disorder of the imagination. Within 100 years, Rousseau's dictionary of music was suggesting that disquieting sorrows, passions de souvenir, could be caused by the cow herding songs. He says this. And within another hundred, Baudelaire, Balzac, and other sensitive souls could fear death by longing. This goes on. Illness, I guess, to illness and metaphor, TB. Um, and I don't get to the music till the very end. And I don't think there's anything interesting there, except that I did say that the only thing these women are nostalgic for is those lucrative gigs in Vegas. <laughs> but what's but I couldn't too. write this anywhere else. What's interesting is that it ends up in a book that is academic, and 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 sure. um, well, I if you don't if you don't own it, must, must buy crossovers. But um, the point is, you couldn't write this anywhere. Right, right, right. But what, what, but what I'm interested in is how, at the time, um, you I, I mean, as as Robert said, you're always ahead of the wave, and there there was a shift all around in ethnography or ethnographic writing, you know, with a new ethnography and so on. And there you were sort of leading the way. Um, and now it's in You your think. The last time I submitted an academic article, was rejected for not talking about current research. And I wrote back and said, the current research sucks. <laughs> so this isn't a, to be unnamed folklore journal, correct? This is true. They said nastier things than that. But I thought, do I need this source? And also the other thing I noticed as you started reading is, you know, the very poetic nature of your writing um, and the courses at Penn at that time, um, bridging literature and ethnography, or literature as ethnography. So, you know, you were, there you were, leading the way. <laughs> I mean, girly magazine or not, you know? <laughs> They paid. <laughs> now Esquire is doing it's away with women's It's just that the academic pictures. journals had to catch up. <laughs> and they haven't yet. And they haven't yet, yeah. No, yeah, uh, sure. JF reads a lot better than he used to, right? Yeah. It takes on subjects it wouldn't touch before. and it, um, So biography is a genre that you've been working in a lot. And um, why did you make the shift? I mean, what, what drew you to biography and these, these very large and elusive subjects? No, I had no interest in biography, didn't, didn't read them particularly. And, um, I, I started because of Sun Ra, who was, was um, started out in the same town where I partly grew up, and at the same time I, w I would have been there. And then I was living a few blocks from him in Philadelphia. This, this is already interesting. And I was running into him at places like Swarthmore and on the train to New York and so on. And I thought, this is interesting. And, I, and there was a lot of weirdness about him. And Philadelphia had, at the time, a lot of real weirdness. Um, Ira Einhorn had chopped up his girlfriend, was on the front porch. Remember him? The guy that, um, the guy that John Cage, John Cage said was one of the ten most important thinkers in history, along with you know Thoreau and so forth. And then there was another cult uptown that was Move. But this this seemed to be, to be something else. This was an art cult. And I thought that could be fun. And I, I thought no one would ever do it. It was true, they weren't gonna do it. This guy was on Saturday Night Live and he was on the front of Rolling Stone and he'd been played before 300,000 people at a Communist Party rally in um, somewhere in France. So I thought I'd do something small, but when I got into his library and started reading his stuff, which seemed to me the thing to do, and I'd read his notes, it took me into theosophy and to um, uh, late 18th century French thinking and um, anti-Catholic tracts from the one period or another, and uh, this is pretty fascinating stuff. And I, um, I think, um, I think, I, well, I, I, that was all I was gonna do. And, but just to get through this, it took a long time. It was very hard work, a lot of reading that was, nobody else would wanna do. And it was really educating me. Now, this is cool in, in the sense that I would never have done this otherwise. I'd never gotten to know how a person thought about things if I didn't do this. I don't know what he was dead by the time I, I finished it, but I'm thinking um, um, this is a way of, uh, of writing um, fiction and not writing fiction. And it's a way that liberates you in certain ways, takes you into areas you wouldn't get to otherwise. So the second one, what was the second one? Hmm, I'll 
Miles Davis, Miles Davis, yeah. This is just because I found out through a fluky way, now this has a folklore side actually. Roger and I had done this two volumes of um, annotated bibliography of African American culture through AFS, but somehow it disappeared, right? It totally disappeared. They, AFS didn't have pushed it. They seemed to be embarrassed by it. I don't know. So they were kind of rare. If you try to get them now, they're expensive. So I get this. I found out that the long interviews done by um, Miles's autobiographer, um, when she, is this going out beyond these walls? Yes. No, we'll drop that story. It's a limited client, so that's okay. Um, well, at any rate, I found that these, this huge, amount of material was in the Schomburg and it was the original interviews. And I, and I got a glimpse of it by accident and the interviews weren't matching up with the book in radically different ways. And so I thought, now this is interesting. What if I were to write a book which corrects the record using the author's actual words rather than um, making it up myself? So I did that and then uh, Simon Schuster's um, lawyers said, you can't do this because you haven't got permission to do it. In fact, I only got it, I'm the only person who's ever seen this, and I only got it, this is the tie-in to folklore. The only reason I got it is that Howard Dotson, the director, called me one day, or secretary called and said, we hear you want to use these, these um, embargoed interviews. And I said, yeah, and I said, well, would you, would you like to have copies of all of them? You know, it was five feet high, I said, yeah. And then I thought, uh, is there anything else here? I mean, just you're handing me these things? Well, Sir Dotson would like a favor. He'd like to be able to reprint all of yours and Roger's stuff. He never did, but um, that was it. So I got through that way. I re this, and Simon Schuster's people said, you can't use this without permission, or if you do, you can't say what you've done, and you can't make it sound like it's Miles Davis. So I wrote around the subject, correcting all the things, and some were really big, I mean, like, um, famous thing, scene about um, kicking heroin on his father's farm. His father was an upper middle class dentist who had <coughs> who bought, who bought uh, hogs from Churchill and things like that. Um, and everyone said, well, he, he kicked this habit just there on the farm. But if you read the stuff, he says in the thing, I thought I kicked it, but I went to Detroit, it was back on in two days. So there goes the drama and the, the arc of the narrative and, and the rest of it. Stories like, um, is it true, Miles, that you, your father chased a man around East St. Louis when he called you a nigger when you were a kid? He said, who told you that story? That's some bull crap. I mean, anyway. No one ever called me a nigger, and my father didn't even have a shotgun. So, oh, that's interesting. But then I began to read his, his meetings with Jean-Paul Sartre, which aren't in there. I said, wow, this is great. But the problem is the book got reviewed twice in the Times, both badly, that is bad to me, um, and no one knew what had happened. They just sort of thought I was tinkering at the edges. Some people actually said he's just repeated the whole, <coughs> the whole other book. And right at the time, I, weren't, I wasn't aware that um, um, those people aren't well paid, by and large, you know, those reviewers. They got piles of books to read. They're not going to argue with this stuff. I mean. So that put me on, on alert. Then came Jelly Roll Morton, which Anna got me into. Um, didn't you? Yeah, Jelly Roll Morton. But that was a real pleasure, a short, a short <coughs> time. And that just required looking up, uh, reading Alan's uh, notes, um, finding things he didn't use, finding uh, some, some lines in there that are just wonderful. I mean. Doesn't the whole picture of Jelly Roll Morton change for you? You know, what, what is the picture? He's a blowhard, a, a, <coughs> um, a liar, a user, whatever, right? So Alan says to him at one point, talking about Tony Jackson, this kind of um, dandy piano player who, was, who he had already admitted was better than he. It's not that Morton ever said he was the greatest. He always said this other guy was the greatest. So <coughs> Alan says, um, what were, your, what were your dealings with Tony Jackson? Like, well, Tony Jackson was a great player, I say to him, but he had this long hair, he said, and it always bothered me. He said, I saw went over to the, uh, what was it, Paris Opera House in New Orleans, that David? So, Paris Opera? <coughs> it's the Opera House in, Paris, in, in oh, New Orleans. Opera. French Opera, yeah, yeah. And I saw these long-haired musicians. and said, no, oh, I, I uh, and So Alan picks up on what he's signifying and says, are you saying he was a, a fairy? And he said, he might have been a tugboat. Yeah. <laughs> this is pretty hip for 19, what, 
<laughs> what were the dates of the thing? I don't even remember. 40 something? <laughs> that was easy. Uh, also, when he gets into rants like, um, and wonderful rants, he wants to say the jazz is a methodology, not a thing. It's a, um, it's a way of being. It's so that it's not about the thing you're playing, and the, it's about how you play it. It ain't what you, what's that old song? It ain't what you do, it's the way it should do it. Yeah. Uh, um, and he's, uh, he's telling you, he, in the meantime, is correcting both the Cuban players and the St. Louis uh, ragtime players for not having the right attitude as they play and what have you. I find this very fascinating. But then he said, people have criticized me for playing, um, uh, what was it? Maple Leaf Rag, an old Scott Joplin thing, because he said that's not a fit tune for serious jazz playing. And I had to explain to him that it's not about the, it's not about the tune, it's how you approach it. For example, he said, now Toscanini, now Toscanini at this point was God. He was on NBC, you know, every, all the time, and uh, he, he was number one. He said, if Toscanini were to play one of my tunes, it would be awful, because the talent's just not there. He said, <laughs> he said we'd come out like the third fold of a corn crop. Can I interject something here? Um, That's right, it's a roast, I forgot. Um, no, 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 it, it's actually, I mean, you, you, you bring this up. Um, Robert's actually going to ask you about the Lomax book, but in saying what you're saying and about jazz being a way of doing things, etc., I'm thinking of the Billie Holiday book. And um, uh, as you point out in the book, it's, it's, it's not your conventional biography. Mm. Um, and it strikes me as if what you're, what you're really doing in that book is uh, telling her life through the way she sang. Um, and what I want to ask you is, um, is, is, is that a matter of, of style? In other words, I think what you're, what you're talking around right here in terms of jazz, but then also in so many of the other things you've done is, um, uh, what you're trying to get at, it seems to me, and so many of the things that you write, is the core of a style um, that's, you know, culturally um, Maybe. Uh, it's, a, it's not, uh, I'm not conscious of it, and I wish I'd said that. And <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd said what uh, the New Yorker writer said, that Holiday's book, which I, 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 this is funny, I said in the book, I, um, I don't introduce myself in, in these books as something important. I never comment, I never value anything, and that always costs you some reviewers who say, we don't know, the New York Times writer who said, we heard nothing about, we never heard nothing about Miles Davis's Oedipal relationship with Charlie Parker. Well, I would never have written that if there was one, but, but you know, that, I was avoiding that. So I said in this book, for the first time, I felt obliged to introduce myself to defend her against her commentators. And damned if the Washington Post didn't say he patronized her. And you don't patronize a dead person, do you? I mean, uh, does anyone ever say matronized, by the way? Yeah. I've been matronized by people. Um, so, uh, damn, you be honest and they get at you. They don't, you know, it, it's a secret to be dishonest, maybe. And, but the point is, <laughs> <laughs> what you're saying. Um, I, the New Yorker writer said, he should have gone further and said that her book, not only being a statement of, of um, independence and um, non-victimage, presenting the terrible things in her life and saying, I'm not a victim, and you know, anything bad happened, I set myself up for it. He said, you should have said, the whole book was an indictment of the whole of the United States starting from its educational system, it's, it's absolutely true. I, I, I should have said that. Uh, she provides you this critique of the health system, drug laws, the immigration laws. It's just all their schools, Catholicism, the music business. But what's interesting to me is that, I mean, all of that is true, but what's interesting to me is that, um, and, and you know, I'm no expert on Billie Holiday, but given what you've written and what I've heard, you know, in her singing is that um, her style, to use that word, or the way she sings, um, in some way, in, in, in some form or other, embody that. You know, that the kind of the kind of resistance, the kind of you know, sort of breaking from. Uh, you know, I, I don't have the language to to explain it as well as you do, but I, I think you really lay it out in that book. And if you want, I'll review it for you. 
<laughs> Sales are small. You, know, <laughs> you also got at multiple angles of vision of uh, Billy Holiday, and, and uh, you know, so I, I thought the structure was a little curious because you began with a sort of the uh, you know demystifying certain things, the people who surrounded him, or the celebrities, the the the, the, the book that preceded it, that uh, and then then you then you got into a very deep kind of. Uh, Formal analysis of, of, of the music and the song. Well, that's easy to explain. Did, I, yeah. I didn't. I started to do the second part, and that was it. And then I found the original draft of her book, and I found the uh, um, before it was edited. And then I found um, a bunch of unpublished material. So I thought <clears throat> I'm only going to get one chance at this, and I uh, didn't have enough to make a book out of the first stuff. But I had so I put the two together, and several people, Washington Post guy particularly, said. It's an ill-conceived format. It's probably true. But uh, isn't it interesting to know the people she had affairs with, like uh, Orson Welles and Elizabeth Bishop? And, you know, I mean, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's just anecdotal, but it, does, it, it changes the whole horizon of her life. It changes, it puts her in a different um, dimension of things. And, and uh, uh, gay men who offered to marry her, I didn't go into detail on that, but, you know, um, a Yale professor of music and so forth and so on. Um, then someone says, I'm name dropping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, but she dropped the names I didn't. <laughs> and her affair you just me. picked them up. <laughs> <laughs> and in, in, in 2002, the, the two women who, who wrote the film, uh, who did, did the film uh, Boys Don't Cry, were working on a film about Billy Holiday and Orson Welles. And I knew they, they weren't likely to have what I had, so I checked and they said, we had one sentence. We were gonna generate the film off that one sentence. I said, wow, I got a and the, the sentence wasn't that much. Me and, me and, um, me and Orson hung out together, or <laughs> something like that. I said, man, I could do this. And you know, I had a description of him in his shorts and, playing all the parts of the movie and so forth. I thought this was real, real stuff to have, and to know that, say, Elizabeth Bishop and her, her partner broke up over Billy, that, that's, that's pretty cool. It, it tells you about the times, it tells you about... Um, this is the presenting? It tells you the kind of freedom that these people were having that I think, as the Foucault says, we always have to create somebody, maybe somebody said, we always have to create somebody who's more oppressed than we to justify that we're cool. Um, so it's the Victorians, you know, well, you know, 50s, late 40s, 50s New York was a, was a very free society. It was, um, in fact, you could go to shows for free. That's a story I hear from all the people. You could, you could go to the, go the rehearsals for free. You could see Robert Kraft conducting Stravinsky premieres for free. People were freer. I mean, um, I thought this was important to try to get it. Whether I did it well or not is another question, but I can't, I can't believe that people would say I was name dropping. It's, it's this hard. Turning to the uh, Lomax biography and thinking about what we can learn from Lomax and we, what we learned about Lomax in reading the biography, uh, first of all to say that it, it was an absolutely magnificent and calm, uh, crystallized uh, account of folks on scholarship and what shaped him and the, you know, contextualizing Alan and his father in, in, in the times and in the uh, really the intellectual history of folklore. And, and, you, uh, and I think this is probably the work where you spoke most about folklore, uh, there were, and you drew out, drew out some, some selections from things that uh, Alan said over the years that I, I wanted to ask you about and, and comment on. One of the things that uh, Alan said was, I think we knew and he, he expressed to me as well that he felt uh, marginalized and he kind of gave up on folklore and, and uh, mm -hmm. felt almost like a, like a pariah. Um, you know, I personally feel that that, that was uh, personalized to a, to a uh, 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 considerable extent, uh, you know, he wasn't the easiest of person, but people, but he was a, uh, you know, an absolutely extraordinary scholar, and he lot to, had a lot to say. What, one of the things that he said about folklore that you bring up in the book was that uh, amidst the, I'm paraphrasing, the, the vast mass of text, there was no spinal hypothesis, and, and you speak as well about um, two of the things that Alan was looking at in, in, in the analysis of folklore and, and, and uh, looking at the big picture. Uh, was the uh, micro uh, analysis of behavior and, and um, that I think relates to some people you were associated with at, at, at Penn as well, Irving Goffman and others. And he also um, did a, a, a grand comparativist uh, study of patterns of, of music, song, and, and speech uh, throughout the world. 
So uh, I guess uh, a question is, um, thinking about folklore, and uh, mm -hmm. do you think it, it addresses big questions? Uh, how about the validity of what Alan said? And, and uh, comparativism is something which has come, come out of fashion in folklore. And, and what do you think are some mm, of the big questions with, that folklore can address? Folklore with a capital F or folklore with folklorist, I mean. I, I've, I've been thinking since I'm really glad I came and got invited to this. It's, it's reminded me that I thought that uh, this is a really noble enterprise. I, was, I thought I had at the time as a student that um, this goes back, you know, I mean, anthropologists struggle to get themselves into history by pointing back to what, what, what were they into at one point? Montesquieu, maybe? I don't know. But they always forced that Enlightenment connection. It was always like, um, yes, we're the heirs of Enlightenment. I don't know. It was never convincing. It was something you could talk about in 1970 or whatever, one, one term, and it was over. But, but folklore really had these roots. It had roots in, in um, it was Roger who said to me, when I was talking to him about um, early collectors, and Roger said, well, you know, is this right? You said something to the effect that, um, that they must have taken a lot of crap too, right? For different things. What are you doing messing with these people and why are you taking them up to, you know, your betters and what's up with you? Um, is that what you said? I, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I sent that file to you. Hmm. Roger's files can break your computer. It <laughs> <laughs> should come with a warning, software warning. Um, but anyway, I, I was thinking, um, that little quote I had about, I used yesterday, about well, who'd want to become a f folk collector? You're going to take crap from everybody for things you can't even imagine coming. You're too radical, you're too reactionary, you're too you're a thief, you're too, you know, I don't know. Uh, you're aiming for it. So, um, I really had respect for these people, and even the plagiarizers, or quasi-plagiarizers, the people who rewrote, rewrote all their things, and um, I, 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 I so they rewrote their folk songs. I mean, I don't, it was okay. In fact, I found it, this is going sideways, but I found a Lafcadio Hearn book, called, what is it called? Imitations or something, where he's got little short pieces where he's, he's doing something or other. And he said, oh, tra these are all translations, he said. What is it? No, no, it's not that. It's a really short little book. And he says, these are all translations. And that was very hip at that point in Paris. And he said, some of these are based on memories of things I read some years ago. Some are based on short stories, some are based on a sentence or two, and occasionally on one word. And I was thinking, wow, now this is interesting. He's, he's acknowledging a kind of plagiarism in which would one word could set off an idea. So anyway, I was thinking, uh, I really admired those early people, and, and I don't care if they were hustling better jobs with the, the, Laren, the Lairds, or whoever, and uh, we all are. <laughs> And it was a way of moving. And it was setting off this movement in Europe. And um, you know, Beethoven and all those people were getting into it. And, um, so at any rate, you have that. You have uh, people like uh, people I barely knew, like McEdward Leach, who what, just decides to go, go up in the, in the barren ground in the land in, in, in northern Canada because a friend of his in the anthropology is going. And he has no idea what he's getting into. And they have no food with him. <laughs> And they get out of a boat and there's nowhere to go but across these barren tundras. And this guy said, what, didn't that surprise you? Any of you guys who, who knew Vic Edward, that this guy could um, just leave his comfortable office and go trekking through those, those snowstorms? I mean, geez. So I thought this was a noble enterprise and that, it, that it, uh, it did sweep through art and culture and it did pick up science. And, uh, and Alan fascinated me because <coughs> He had read so much, and I didn't know this until I went through his stuff. I mean, people always say, well, he could be off-putting because he'd been everywhere and, and seen and heard everything, but he had read everything. I don't know how many folklorists were reading the Russian foremost in the 40s. I mean, uh, prop maybe, I don't know, but um, he went way beyond that. And, um, and to be interested in being a, a regional writer, that he could write the New South, he and his, his wife Elizabeth could, could be the new, uh, the new Southern, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what, a realist? Um, you know, people impressed by what's, uh, what was happening with, um, I don't know, never mind, with other areas and so forth. And the, the South needed a reinterpretation. This is well before, what, the, uh, the new agrarians, who, by the way, are, are slicksters. If, 
Um, these guys who want to tell you it's just about the poem and not about the people. So how come we hear about Robert Penn Warren learning um, uh, Frankie and Johnny from, uh, I don't know, his mammy or something or other. He, they contextualize the hell out of black stuff. They want to tell you exactly where it all came from, but then they can blow off T.S. Eliot. We don't need to know anything about St. Louis, that's for sure, or about Prufock. I found this fantastic, these double-dealing Southerners. But Alan was talking about another kind of Southernism. Alan, is, <laughs> Alan told me, called, called um, Faulkner a goddamn parvenu. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Kind of got, didn't you say that? The kind of person could sit on the porch with a drink and say, watch a lynching and say, it's a damn shame. <laughs> anyway, you know, having been raised a little bit in the South and having it haunt me forever, um, I had dreams about it forever, I think. I think um, I can imagine how you would want to remake the South. You would want to put it, do it in your head first and then do it some other way. And I think that's one of the most productive reasons the Southern writers have gotten through. They, you know, I don't understand. Um, I don't understand Tennessee Williams well enough to speak with authority, but um, he's doing all kinds of remaking in his books: his own life, his sister's life, people he knew, and he's doing it in such great detail and and care. I've been thinking about the opening of um, *Streetcar Named Desire* when when Blanche Dubois gets to that neighborhood and she sees this black. You, you don't quite see it yet, but. It's coming in the text that they're black women talking to white women on a, on a stoop. And he says, um, they, you can hear a tinkling blues piano upstairs. And then he says, yes, it's that kind of neighborhood. Because these people reading this book are not going to know what that neighborhood is. And what he's, he did that in um, that play that never got produced, although it, was, it was, went straight to video called um, The Loss of a, The Loss of a, Tear-shaped diamond, which involves a woman, never mind, but it involves flooding the fields in the 20s and so forth, and um, has a wonderful, uh, I'm getting way off the track, aren't I? Well, well, I guess I was asking about the big questions in folklore. And, and, uh, which are? That, that, well, that, that, that's what I'm asking you, and that's what Alan was looking for. What, what, were the, what in your mind were the big questions that Alan was, was sort of um, addressing? Yeah. Addressing or after. Oh, that's tough. And with Anna, my uh, unnamed co-author, and it's just as well so she doesn't have to take the crap I took about that book. Um, here, I'm, I'm hesitant to say. Um, well, so let me well I mean, this, the simplest one is I suppose that, 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 you know, the text is not the thing. Um, uh, as Daryl wrote, this thing's a text. Um, it, it, the text was something that you saw and you felt and you, you know, it, it, Hmm? Um, Anna, could you step up to the microphone? Because we're recording this, and I think that it's important to have it on the record. Thank you. That I have known and talked with. And so the thing about the South is that a lot of people say that they didn't know anything was going on there during the slow holocaust of the post-Civil yeah. War period. They didn't know that this was happening. And the Southern writers were doing the same thing. That's why they're so loved, because they bring out the atmosphere of this sort of romance, of the pi pianos tinkling and the blues singers and these black people that fig figure sort of mythical figures like in Fa Fa Faulkner and so on. But they were not facing at all what was happening. They were not mentioning it. You're not supposed to talk about it even now. Mm -hmm. Okay? Nothing. You're supposed to keep quiet. And that's how it is. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what went on, and nobody wanted to talk about it then, and that's it. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. and that's, well. that's why I want to know people that 
because it was unbearable. Well, you know, the, um, Alan, at, his, uh, at some peaks of emotion, talks about being ashamed of his people. But he means every, all the white people and so on. And, uh, and that um, maybe the most moving thing is, is that little text from uh, the Library of Congress, the, its own record, where he's introducing um, various black performers. And he talks about the communities, black communities in the South that were lonely for their neighbors to, to be neighbors with them and how hard it was to live in a place where your neighbors couldn't be neighbors. Um, he's, he's what, the, one of the few white people in the room in this performance, you know, with, with all these, these black performers. And uh, I don't know, how, how old was he, 20 some? This is a pretty amazing document. It was a place he's talking like, um, I kept thinking of Freud's uh, civilization and its discontents. This guy got really discontented <laughs> in the civilization which he's finding um, hard to bear. Later, he found metaphors for this, you know, the Holocaust and so on, and he's talking about well, the, you know, the, that, that was the Holocaust. It was more like uh, the SS, you know, dogs and so forth, and the prisons, and um, um, there was all that moral basis, but then the big question is, um, um, what does it mean to hear a song, and what a song is, and what does it, how does it work? Um, but he had the same interest in folk tales, and he wanted to make them work together, and he wanted to use the same kind of, same kind of um, methodology on this, and he even was toying with a kind of scheme for um, analyzing folk tales in that respect. But in his early, very earliest writing, um, on the trip with Zora Neale Hurston and um, Barnacle, um, he's down in um, down the Bahamas. He's on a boat, and he's feeling the boat. You know, men are working in the, the fishing boat. You can feel the ship. You can hear the, 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 the cables pulling and the waves and so on. And, and he's trying to describe what, it, what you hear as a person who's working, the kind of music of the sea. It doesn't, he doesn't get corny about it. He just says, you know, uh, he, he doesn't quite say you can feel it in your muscles. And what's that word for propitiation? What's that, propitiation? Do you feel, you pull something? Was it? Okay. Yeah, he doesn't quite say that, but that's where he's going. It's you can feel this in, your, in you as you watch these people pull the sails. And they're singing, yeah, but he doesn't tell you that at first. The singing is like, you know, just come second to these creak of these, uh, these um, pulleys and, and the waves, and then the, the sea shifts and the whole sound changes. It's a pretty amazing passage for a person that young. Uh, to, uh, it's not exactly what you would do on a sea cruise like that, with, uh, particularly if you were interested in folklore, you wouldn't be describing it in, that, in a particular way. I don't know, big ideas. What is the big idea of folklore? That's not rhetorical. I mean, um, is it that um, people who are ignored uh, are artists, or is it um, uh, the rest of us are missing out on something? Or this is the basis of all that we call art? It's certainly the way uh, James Russell Lowell put it. You know, his mother was from the Orkneys and he'd heard these songs and um, he's thinking, um, and here are the Brits telling us we have no culture. <laughs> and, and their culture is stolen and we got better folk songs. I mean, that's, um, that's a big idea. I think something that I was struck by in the book is that, you know, again, micro behaviors and grand comparative scheme to look at, look at exquisite detail at what's happening in, in a, you know, in, in, in a in, you know, particular dimension of folklore we're looking at and, and uh, in social interaction and then to look at the grandest comparative scheme about patterning in, in uh, folklore around the world, right? And I guess this was two dimensions of mm -hmm. Alan's work. Isn't it interesting that that whole microbehavioral thing of the 70s has gone? Well, at least I don't know where it is, if it's there. This was hot stuff. One thought I had about it being gone, it was kind of overwhelming. I mean, if you read Ray Birdwistle and he says, I figure there's 10,000 some combinations of facial gesture that you can make with different parts of the body. Well, it's a pretty overwhelming idea. And if you don't know, very few people ever got to see Ray Birdwistle perform, but he, had, uh, he could perform could perform different characters. He could change his character in front of you, particularly by moving his hair backward. 
the hair scalp <laughs> that would sort of move backwards, and he'd be talking very seriously, shift into a voice of someone saying, I'm innocent, and his, his hair would move backwards. His face would open up. <laughs> but you knew he was a fraud, like the character he's describing. He's fra doing a fraudulent character. He had so perfected this stuff that he had a few students who followed him who, who I don't think ever um, carried on really what he was doing. He also didn't write. That was the problem. He chose not to write. And um, you really had to be around him. Some of you studied with him. I mean, you know him better than I do from that point of view. But there were people like that working for different directions, and Alan was doing this stuff. I don't know why this doesn't matter anymore, and why people will insist that they can write a dissertation on a song form or whatever and how it's, uh, what it's about and not describe how the songs are performed or, or what it means, what these physical gestures mean and what, um, how a single gesture, that's why I mentioned Kate Blanchett. She's in um, I'm Not Here. She's doing word for word one of Dylan's interviews in the back of a taxi, I believe, chain smoking like he was doing. And she's getting roughly the Dylan kind of surliness at that point. And he's talking about why he can't use the word folklore anymore. He's using words traditional and how mysterious and how um, open-ended or whatever he's saying about. And then all of a sudden, she leans back in the seat, takes smoke the cigarette and said, besides, everyone knows I'm not a folk singer. And then she turns and looks in the camera and grins. Now that, that caught Dylan better than Dylan. I mean, that grin, <laughs> it comes on top of that profound denial. That, uh, one, one last question about Alan, something that I was uh, struck by in the book, and I just, it, it just provoked so much thinking on my part, where he uh, was speaking about how he was, you know, employed some positivistic approaches to, to, to science and, and uh, drew from different aspects of sciences. And then, you know, towards the last paragraph you mentioned, you quote Alan as saying, the romantic tradition has long provided a neat emotional balance to the practical operational forces in Northwest European culture, it's crucial that we get, gain some perspective on this very unusual in the eyes of most humans, rather outlandish cultural tradition. And then I thought about Alan, and you know, those of us who know Alan know that he was, you know, he, he worked in and through science, and he was also romantic, like so many of us of our, are. And uh, so it, it should we own up to and acknowledge and, um, uh, you know, fess up to the, the uh, we being romantics and, and because this is a uh, Western tradition and uh, in terms of the passion we have for what we look at. Are you talking about romantics in the, in the sense of a um, literary term or the, or the romantics? Well, I was thinking about that. I was, you know, I was trying to... I'd um, love to be a romantic. I mean, mm, well, but you, you know, I mean, those people in their why? short lives... Why outlive. would you love to be a romantic? Well, I don't know. I'm, um, would I, wouldn't, we, wouldn't you want to be Mary Shelley? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's a, Only if you were Percy Bissey. <laughs> there, there's a BBC film about Byron that I, I can't get out of my head. Some of you may have seen it. It, it opens, I believe, when he's uh, in Turkey and he sees these Turks. Someone's in a bag. It's a human being trying to get out of a bag. And he says, to the captain of this group, release that person, you swine. And all these scimitars, is that what they're called? Come out, and his people pull out uh, I don't know, short little <laughs> pocket knives or something. And then he looks around and says, let me say instead, please, sir, as a, as a what do we call it, prince of the realm? As a prince of the realm, I kindly ask you to release that person, you swine. <laughs> Cut to him sitting talking to a Turkish general, colonel, and he says, so Lloyd Byron, what are you doing in Turkey? He said, I thought I was in Greece. <laughs> <laughs> and then he lectures Byron on the history of Turkey being Greece. And so that, I'd kill to do that. I'd kill <laughs> to just be in that, that conference. In, in the same way as the film shows, him, his wife was a mathematician. You may know this story. His daughter may have invented the first computer. It was, it was water driven, which explains why it didn't, wasn't real, actually. So she's this brilliant mathematician, and he, but he, when he meets up with her family, um, they're very religious, and he makes fun of it. 
And she is forced to defend her family, which throws him because he thought she was a scientist. And, she, you know, what she, and she's saying, you don't understand this dimension of spirituality, this and that. And he listens to it and then bows to her and says, as you say, madam, as you say. I mean, this is, this is hipsterism. <laughs> this is, these are cool people. I mean, the, uh, didn't the Shelleys take in um, um, orphans? Um, Let's see, I'm forgetting my, my studies, but I think, it, I think it was the show. They got up on, 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 a, on the top of a roof, and when people came in with their caps and gowns with their hoods, they were dropping pamphlets into their hoods. So, so you didn't see them, but they'd take the hoods off and these pamphlets would fall out. And finally, behind all the romantics was Leigh Hunt. Uh, Leigh Hunt, who turns out to be a black man somehow written out by the history of romanticism. I've yet to find a professor who teaches and who knows that, who was running a newspaper and spent two years in jail because he called the Prince Regent a fat pig and was constantly being um, catered to by all the romantics who considered themselves his follower. He even wrote the things on how black writing was different from white writing. Now, how could this have slipped through the cracks? I mean, <laughs> I first discovered Leigh Hunt by a small folkloric fact. He's describing a parade on um, Pall Mall, I guess it is, and the Queen's birthday. And he says, um, he, you know enough from the description that these are, I can't believe they're African, but they could have been. Um, the drum corps were black, Caribbean. So and they, they were wearing, um, as some drum corps still do, they had kind of jerkins or whatever that were made of animal skins, which you still see some college groups wear. So he's describing this. I'm thinking, you know, what kind of person would be describing a drum corps at that point? And then he says, one chap threw his cymbals into the sun and caught them before they fell on his fellow's heads. <laughs> he had to be this guy from the West Indies, right? <laughs> Who appreciated that sort of thing. Well, uh, one thing that's always stuck with me from what I learned from John Schwett is about the artful use of indirection. So we're getting answers to all the questions, and I think you have another one on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I wanted, I wanted to, to sort of segue into, I mean, to, to draw the parallel between the Maverick Lomax and the Maverick Schwett. Um, be, mm, and, and, and I have to say that um, there, there was only one occasion which I was in Lomax company and it was also in the company of John and Robert, um, the four of us were in a New York deli. And um, in my memory tells me, or maybe I'm making it up in this situation, that I could see the parallel between the two. Um, so the shift I want to make is <clears throat> to um, your sense of adventure, but, but in a slightly different context, um, in the 19, uh, early 70s, late 80s, uh, late 60s, in Philadelphia, and the creation of the Center for Urban Ethnography. Um, because if, if the South was a place where you couldn't say or uh, tell certain things, certainly uh, the urban centers of American cities um, you know, were also uh, not being uh, properly addressed. And although it's in your crossovers, and you told a little bit last night, I think just for the record, since this is being um, uh, recorded and for the company here, can, can you sort of relate to us um, how that was conceived, including what happened at Temple and also the famous corned beef sandwich in the South Philly Deli with Goffman, uh, and, and, the, and the beginning of the Center for Urban Ethnography? Well, it was... Um, um, a difficult time in many, many ways, and, um, um, but also thrilling and, um, and, and tacky. But, um, what happened was that I had a, a friend or acquaintance who was worked for, the, the, uh, what was he working for? The um, National Institute of Mental Health. And he, he gave me a pitch one day in Washington of how um, they were putting out um, offers for people to bid on various ways of dealing with black communities. And the thrust of them were to militarize the communities, to find new kinds of policing techniques and to bring in more people to uh, control them and to basically to box them in. And he said they were getting these, they were getting these funds. 
and there wasn't much theoretical stuff behind it. It was just practical. I mean, how do we um, how do we do this um, expeditiously and um, maybe quietly? I don't know. And he said it was it was horrifying to read, and some of it was coming through uh, mental health monies. He said, and he said, have you ever thought about the possibility of confronting this with the opposite side, which is to say there's nothing unnatural about these communities, but they're perfectly normal. Funny that at the time I was reading J.K. Chesterton, who was upset by anthropology, who he thought was kind of fraudulent. You should read this sometime. It's good for folklore, too. He talks about, um, um, he said, uh, anthropologists are so set on finding a reason for everything that they become unreasonable. They find reasons, he, and, 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 he, and he goes to some length in, uh, oh, uh, um, the Golden Balp takes a real beating on this. Uh, and he said, so they, they turn gravestones into, into altars and so forth. He said, and they wonder why people put flowers on graves. He said, the reason they put flowers on graves, at least speaking from his point of view, he said, I have two ants who if I didn't put the flowers on there, would make my life miserable. <laughs> and then he turns to, um, to Ireland and said, he was sick of Irish writers who wrote about it as a, as a strange and mysterious country, when in fact he said, it was a perfectly normal country, it was England that was strange and mysterious. <laughs> and that the, the, that the, um, the stovepipes, the stovepipe hats, as he puts it, of London, uh, don't exist there. And so I, these guy's telling me the same thing. Is there a normal community out there? And I said, oh, I don't know whether I can make this pitch or not. This is, um, I don't know what to do with this. So I went to a couple of things he suggested I, I go to, the Association for the Advancement of Science or whatever. It was kind of a cool place to be in certain ways. They were having rump demonstrations outside. And um, Chomsky was leading one of them. And Chomsky was talking about changing education in America and uh, the revolution education that was needed and testing. Now I was up on testing, I'd read a lot about it and I was interested to hear this. And then at some point in this talk, he talked about how testing would be turned for new uses in the new society. And somebody yelled out, I thought we were against test. He said, well, society will always need some kind of test to show is it achieving its goals. And this kid yelled out, that's, what that's how they, that's how they uh, justify it now. And he said, you're interrupting me. And I thought, man, I don't like the looks of this. It's spilling over into the, the other side. I went to a, a memorial service for, no, it wasn't. It was some professor was getting fired at Temple because he refused to grade students. And then he said, um, he negotiated with the administration. He said, what if I gave them all A's? They said, that would be your choice. He said, what if I gave them all F's? They said, you couldn't do that. So he got all his students to sign something that said um, they wouldn't take grades and he'd write letters for them. And they fired him. So they brought in lots of people to defend him, ex-graduate students, specialists, Paul Goodman was there, I remember this. And somebody had, one of the students had done a statistical study of all the students and what they'd done and so forth. So the, <laughs> it turns out to be, it's just the kind of thing the guy hated. And there's Paul Goodman saying, um, Hey, this is, if, if he was here right now, he'd be telling you to shut up. And the crowd started booing him. I said, I don't like the feel of all this. And then the guy said, what if you had a million dollars? And then I got interested and said, no. So I went to um, the chair at Temple and said, what if we did this? He cut me off in mid-sentence and said, I don't want tramp scholars hanging around here. I don't want uh, this and that. So I said, the hell with this. So I was so stupid, I, I thought they would just give me the money and I could do something, and then I found, oh, that's not true. They, you've got to have some kind of institutional platform, as we would say today. And um, I didn't have any. And then somebody said, Irving Goffman is flailing about to justify that he is not teaching any courses at, at Penn to speak of, and, which was true. And he said, well, this would be a good justification. Uh, we can do this and we'll get Dell in on it. And, um, uh, how far do I go with this? Um, the, the word got out, and then all kinds of weirdness start to hap happen. Um, the psychology department wanted some of the money, and they wanted to meet with Dell and Irving and I. And they were very serious cats, these, these people. And, um, and they're talking about what they would do with it, and I don't know what they were going to do with something. And Dell was drinking too much. And, and um, um, 
I don't know, somehow Rachel Lindsay's name came up. <laughs> and Dell starts beating the table. He's got a wine glass. <laughs> he says, fat, oh, I know what it was. Guy said, these are going to be, uh, with all these fat bucks you've got, you could do something. And Dell goes, fat black bucks on a wine barrel floor. Boom, belay, boom, belay, boom, belay. And I could see the psychologist saying, whoa. This is, this is, and Dell is meanwhile, uh, uh, Irving is saying, why don't we call this the ethnography wing? That has a kind of British feel to it. And he said, and we could, we could, um, we could deinstitutionalize the thing. We wouldn't have any stationery or phones or typewriters or, or whatever. And then we would never have to write letters because you would have to answer those letters when they came back and you'd have to take calls, you'd have to call back, but we would never be home. I said, we could get an answering machine that said we're never home. He said, no, that's, that's too provocative. <laughs> so this is starting to get interesting to me. Um, well, we got the money, and we started recruiting people, and the anthropology department, at least in part, threatened to sue us for racism because we had set aside money for African-American uh, scholarships. Uh, Igor Kopitov, his name I'll mention here, threatened us. But he already hated Dell anyway. They had a, they had a punch out over hidden research or whatever was going on. It was going, but they, were, they were embargoing dissertations and they'd gotten into some kind of, so there was this hostility. The only place that was interested in us per se was folklore. Kenny, uh, Kenny Goldstein. Enter Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> and Kenny said, and you could teach in the department. I said, well, you know, okay. So um, I did this, the money started flowing in. Um, and we were in this wonderful place until um, Hackney. Hackney became president and had us thrown out. Well, I'll stop, I'll stop my rant well, on that in, at this in, point. In that place that many of you also entered, piles, books, papers, and so on, um, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, terrific ideas took hold. And, um, and of course, those ideas then went into the classroom and as Robert and I know, you know, affected all of us. Um, Simon, Amy, everyone, Steve. And, uh, yeah, we brought, you know, um, we paid for people like Bill above and we- Right, right, we right. Got, well, um, and Dan Rose, and there were- Well, there. also, um, Bird Russell, Irving talked him into coming and so on. We, right. we had, the thing you don't know is that we had, what, well, you did know that we probably had the best entertain, entertainment department. That's what it was. <laughs> um, <laughs> The communications department of the world in the broadest sense of that word. Mm -hmm. Or as Dell would say, if you've never heard this, we were thinking should we change the name folklore? And Dell wrote an eight page single space treatise on this in which he proposed a number of titles. Finally, he settled on this one. And so I can get it more or less right. Department of Communication, in the sense of communication that Edward Sapir used that word in his 1927 <laughs> article, and so and so. And he said, but I'm thinking you're going to have trouble putting this onto the page, you know, it's so so long. Maybe we should just stick with folklore. <laughs> well, we were sitting around doing that, that kind of thing, and um, um, I was told again and again, you don't really work here, you have this soft money. and the second it runs out, you're out. I used to get notes about this all the time from deans. It was boring, hit the stuff. The money kept coming in. And then the money ran out one day. I didn't want to do this anymore, and it moved somewhere else. And um, I stayed on. Somehow the money kept coming in. And then Kenny one day says, isn't it time for you to come up for tenure? I said, Kenny, I don't work here. He said, don't worry about it. <laughs> Uh, so here's the story. I got tenure without ever working for <laughs> uh, So <laughs> Kenny, Kenny could do some weird things, but I will always speak favorably of the man. He knew how to beat the system. By God, he could beat it. I don't know how he did it, but... Uh, <laughs> so, I'm, so, I'm, I'm gonna, oh, yeah, go ahead. Brett. So I'm going to play the straight man again. Um, so, <laughs> oh, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, of a fashion. Uh, so one of the premises of the Center for Urban Ethnography and your work at the time was refuting the, the idea that uh, the culture of poor people, particularly African American people, is pathological. And uh, the, the, the way the rejoinder to that was that um, 
that the expressive culture of African Americans and the way it uh, maintained uh, uh, continuity and, and social organization as a great strength, as as was a, you know uh, extended family structure, you know viewed in a, in a, in a different way than the uh, the pathological cultures pathology approach of uh, many social scientists. So uh, fast forward to 2015. Um, have there been any gains in that view that uh, you, you pioneered among others? You know, uh, Roger and I, we, when we did the uh, two-volume bibliography, um, we had an introduction, which got printed, reprinted somewhere else, I think, maybe in um, a Dutch volume. I can't think what it was called. And one of the things we found was in the history of writing about African Americans in the New World, they'd gone through what we think were three big periods of shifts. Um, I don't remember all the details and so forth. But what was interesting was starting from, I suppose, back before, um, certainly before abolitionism and so on, um, certainly including abolitionism, they, were, they always were the same. They, just the uh, framework change, right? Fill me in, Roger. This was, um, um, <coughs> well, for example, the abolitionists would take the position that the slaves uh, were human beings, etc., but they were like children. And their culture showed that, so they only reprinted their religious material and not their uh, so their other material. And they held this case constant. They had to be brought up to children and so forth. Uh, we would find that again and again in the in the social work in the Caribbean, um, writings about this sort of thing. And we were, we were finding a repeated pattern, which was still in, at, at work at the time of the 70s when we were doing this. But what was truly disheartening was to find that the left and the right shared common premises. They just changed the language. And that was what I was spotting in, in Chomsky. You know, he was still he was going to hold that system in place while he's changing the words for it. It made no sense at all. So th uh, through the, the war on poverty, you could see this coming as well. It was going to be uh, uh, talking about patronizing. And, um, and, and blacks who didn't buy this kind of thing, people like Amiri Baraka, then um, um, what was he known as, <laughs> Leroy Jones, he would write essays about this which would mock these things, and he was, he was a pariah. They, you know, even the Village Voice made fun of him in some ways or other as a hate, hate monger. But he, he was, you know, he had a little essay in a book called Home, which has these attacks on, on the war and poverty and what have you, and one of them is about uh, language. And I remember this, he's talking about black English, which was tough to get across to anybody at that time, still, probably a dead issue now. Um, he said, the old spiritual God don't never change could never be translated into God is unchanging. It would have to be God, God don't never change, no how, no way, no how, no way. No how. No, no way, no way. So anyway, the point being, taking the derivative B aspect of B and extending it fully out through the, t the title of it. Uh, these brilliant little asides about what you don't know and what you don't know about what you're talking and you're messing with here. It was very hard to get even people who were very smart to go on board with this, like Bill LeBove, who was the big knocker on, um, on black English, because Bill had, oh, this is going out to the world, isn't it? Jeez or at least six people. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he introduces one of his informants to one, one day as a pimp, a guy from New Orleans. And the guy, I could see his, he was wounded in the eyes when he says, the lady comes up to me and said, um, the professor was a little lavish in his, his <laughs> introduction. I'm a player, man, not a pimp. <laughs> Then he, then he tells me how to sell watches. <laughs> how you can always, when you're in trouble, you can always sell watches and not get arrested for it. <laughs> so that kind of thing. And I, I got pretty um, uh, exercised over the stupidity and this tim timidity of the discovery that there was a functioning language that was real, real old. And uh, you could find it as old as the slave rebellions that occurred in New York in the early 1700s when the court records would have footnotes to tell you what the words meant. Yeah. You know, Buckra, white man, so forth. And Joy Dillard, there's a sad cat who disappeared from the scene, great guy on 
black naming and so on. Dillard had put marginalia in, like, there ain't nobody here but us Dutchmans. <laughs> so we were seeing this long history of this stuff which they were denying. So, one, so slowly, the linguists were beginning to acknowledge a few differences, but they were all, they were all very superficial, and as Irving, Irving, had the, Irving Goffin had this fear of ethnicity. It was, um, um, it was um, he said, uh, it's, ethnicity is, is the most cosmetic of human phenomena. And he makes some stupid statement about African Americans, and I said, well, you guys are always making uh, remarks about African Americans. You know, there are other ethnicities in America, Jews, for example. And he said, Jews, you should have known my grandfather if you wanted to know a Jew. <laughs> and I, I mentioned this to Saul Worth, the filmmaker, who was there at the time, and so, whoa, that's the oldest Jewishism of them all. The real Jews. <laughs> rest, anyway, uh, Irving, Irving, Irving really thought the ethnicity thing was a joke. He said to Dan Rose, our first research fellow, why do you want to throw your, away your career studying Schwarzes? Instead of what? I don't know. All but, right, so uh, let me shift into the classroom. Can I do that? Because our time is running out. Sure. And with a pen contingent here, we all want to celebrate Kenny's giving John tenure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, just the other day, I was. The, yesterday or the day before I was talking to John and, um, and singing his praises as a professor. And John said, well, you know, I never really wanted to teach anything that I knew anything about. <laughs> um, and right around this same period, he offered a course on Creole literatures, which um, unbeknownst to him maybe was the one thing that kept me a pen um, the semester before the, or the academic year before, I had told Kenny that I, I had no background in anthropology, I really wasn't prepared to do this, and yes, I liked folklore, but I was out of my element in that what I was really interested in was literature. And Kenny said, come on, I'll take you out to lunch. <laughs> so to a we, truck or to a restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he splurged, we went to a restaurant. <laughs> So we talked at length, and he kept asking me all kinds of questions. And then two or three days later, he says, come over here. And he took me over to you, and he says, this is John Swade. You can talk to him about literature. And the following semester, John gave a course on Creole literatures. Now, it may be true that you wanted to teach courses that you didn't know anything about, but I can't believe that with your connection to Himes and your knowledge of Reisman and so on, uh, this wasn't something that you'd been pondering. So, uh, and for us, um, I think I can speak for all of us, but let me just say for myself, it opened an entire new way of thinking, and I think you really cracked the whole Western canon of literature by, by teaching us to read in different ways. Not only written texts, but oral texts and cultural texts and so on. And but it doesn't deny the fact that I, I was over my head and, um, I haven't gotten to the question yet. <laughs> so, let's assume you were over your head, <laughs> which I doubt. Um, and uh, I want to bring the students into the picture of uh, this celebration of John because I think um, they, we certainly felt like a big element and you made us feel like a big element in the discovery of knowledge. Um, that neither you nor we knew. Um, and I'd, I'd like you, if, if you would, to talk a little bit about that time and sort of your engagement in, um, in creolization, which certainly is not uh, the, the, the unique area of interest for you, but, but one that seems to uh, appear throughout if nothing else, in the form of mixtory, as, as you well quote, uh, what's her name, Jeanette um, Smith, what is her name? Anyway, um, and if, if, if you could just recall um, that, 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 that period and some of the work that came out and, and how it influenced you and, and um, where it led you and so on, and um, maybe reflect a little bit on your work with Himes and Creolization and Reisman and any others? Well, it, you, there's the people who were around me, but also you were around me and uh, bringing the Argentine stuff in and lots of, uh, lots of other people. Um, 
that's a good example of some of an idea that um, was way too big to try, unless I was Alan Lomax, uh, to try to do. And um, um, I began to see these parallels that were running in the New World, plus the fact that Creole was the, I said this and no one's ever challenged, it's the oldest, oldest word in the New World in, in a European language that, discuss, that discusses a social process of some sort. I think that's right. And, you know, um, Cotton well, Mather described the candidates at uh, graduation in Harvard as, as Creolians and, you know, it was before that Brazil and Argentina had used these words. So I found it pretty fascinating that this, this term at least in uh, the U.S. was very confusing, and in New Orleans, I began to find, find out that it could mean two huge extremes of things, right? It could be um, the elite, it could be the bottom. And I thought there was a delicious irony here that these things are still playing. And then I think somewhere, someone turned me on to the short-lived, was it the Louisiana Review? It was a bilingual review, didn't run many issues, and they were running, um, translating poems back and forth and so forth. And there was Senghor and some other people popping up in Louisiana. I said, wow, this is amazing. And you know, um, it, Louisiana was never bilingual officially, was it? Well, I, I know about... And then little by little it retreated and it became officially monolingual in 1912 when all public activities were overly banned in that way, so it's real. Now, I'd read, you know, Mr. Jelly Roll, where, where Alan makes this case for these, these different cultures occupying similar spaces and rubbing up against each other. and. Um, then I found letters. Uh, Alan sent that book out to uh, different people in anthropology departments to see what they'd say. And uh, there's one particular one at the University of Chicago said he was he was into something huge that had to do. In, and he mentioned a few other times in history where such things had happened, where these cultural contexts had produced a whole new kinds of things. Plus, I knew that um, that linguistics had. Um, uh, I knew about linguistics. You know, starting to. to play with black English, but I also began to find out about uh, historical linguistics, which has terms for this in European languages, which I'm now forgetting, um, terms in which one word can mean more than one thing, because there's a convergence going on between two words that have certain similarities and so forth. It's very subtle stuff, but it, it opens up the possibility that what we think are mistakes in writing and speaking may be working between two systems. And then when I found out that the, Dell pointed out to me that um, that with the exception of one fairly famous older linguist, linguistics had rejected the possibility that languages could ever merge on a grammatical level, only at the superficial level. Now Irving's, Irving's um, cosmetic ethnicity came back again, which is, this is uh, one of, one of um, linguist, black linguistic students at, at um, Columbia, at um, wherever it was, Penn, um, called attention to the fact that this was being, black English was being discussed as a phonological level thing only. And he said, it's sort of the, we're all brothers and sisters under the phonology argument. It's, you know, and the, and the answer back from the professor was, it's kind of racist to talk about grammar as being different. This is interesting, is it sub, subtext that that's, <laughs> can't be down there? Um, anyway, it's, plus other things are turning up. Um, People who worked in uh, Shran with Shranan and, um, and uh, Dipitaki, the hidden language of um, um, former Dutch Guiana. And um, this is really, you know, pretty wild stuff. And then I began to wonder, has, has, what were the early days of any literature like? And this is where I really fell down and couldn't do the work. Uh, I, found the, I, I made great efforts to find the first Jamaican um, publications, the first South African, in, um, and so on, and really weird things turn up. Um, um, Avant-garde text, there's a, the play, there's a play from South Africa which is in four languages, and they're, they're running crazy across the pages. You know, very few people could have read this or acted it. So uh, then I saw the same thing for Jamaica, Tom Kittle's Wake, and this you know, kind of wild stuff, and several other things, and I think uh, Dan Benamos turned me on to some early, um, uh, Hebrew uh, in Israel where people were playing with high-level high artistic stuff when they were still creating a language. 
and then he, he hit me to eat my, um, what's his name, guy who introduced the idea of poly system, language and literature which is open at every level, and it's, you know, you can't say the line is national or regional or whatever, or class, it's been constantly being bridged together, and he was using the development of, it, of a, a, um, vernacular Hebrew as a model for this in the trouble of, of writing a, a novel in Hebrew, which, what are you gonna rub against to the, that was a concept here, that one rubs against another and a new art comes up, and Alan hinted at that too with the Creoles and so forth. This is pretty exciting stuff, but I didn't know where to go with it. And, and the one or two times I, I tried to take this somewhere like to the first and only, that's interesting, the first and only ethnopoetics conference and the first and only Caribbean linguistics conference, uh, I got attacked for not knowing all the Creoles. I said, you can't talk about this unless you know all the Creoles. And I, then I was thinking, saying, nobody knows all the Creoles. Come on, this is, this, is like, you know, this is crazy. But I think I really caused, the worst problem I got into was I was getting out of hand and I, oh, what was his name, Glissant, great um, Martinique poet and very cool guy. He was incensed when I suggested that certain, that maybe certain French poets could be called Creole, not only because they had Creole mistresses, which I thought was one step in the way of the bottle there, but that their writing was operating like Creole. And he really got livid about that. Now, I didn't know at the time that he hated Creole. And he'd written an essay about how there was a situational language that belonged to slaves. It was only there to confuse the, the, the slaveholders and should be killed off. Whoa, this sound, being to sound like American education was saying, well, that's okay on the street, but in the classroom, you gotta get lose that stuff. And so I don't know, it got, it, um, I guess it was a good idea. Um, uh, some things have come out that are on world literature, which are kind of interesting since then, we try to talk about how countries have been far more, um, um, had far more influence on outside their borders than they did inside and how things were changed by this, certainly how genres were changed. But the topic was just too big and I'm not an Alan Lomax who would say I'll take on the whole world. And I'll, unfortunately a few of you like Lee um, had to suffer through these pitches. And fortunately <laughs> Lee knew how to handle this. <laughs> Lee's a master. And he didn't have to take on the world. John, John one of the things you... Uh, can, I, can I tell oh, just no, a little sure. anecdote? Okay. Yeah. I want to tell a little anecdote from that period. Um, so when John was, as you know, when John gets passionate about something, you know, he goes to it. So he had gathered a little group of people that um, varied, but the core of it was uh, Mick Maloney, Susan Stewart, Ed Hirsch and myself, and we were reading Finnegan's Wake. We'd meet once a week to read Finnegan's Wake, and of course, you know, relied heavily on, on, on Nick, I mean, on Mick, uh, to tell us all the ins and outs of Irish culture. So we had this thing going, and you know, I mean, I shamelessly tell you that we were groupies of John's. And at one point, John was going to give some sort of, he'd been invited to give a talk, or he was giving a talk, I think it was in, in the communications um, department, or someplace anyway. And it was gonna be on Finnegan's Wake. So Susan and I got very excited, and we were living on Germantown Avenue at the time, and we went to a local shop and bought a plastic um, cemetery wreath for Finnegan's Wake, right? And we, bought some candles and we carried them in the trolley on the way over to, to uh, West Philly, set up the stage with a funeral wreath and with the candles and the rest. John comes out, gives this talk on Finnegan's Wake, you know, fine, very well. And then at the end we say, so what'd you think? And he says, what? And I said about, you know, the wreath, there was a wake, you know, did you see the candles? And he goes, oh. No. <laughs> anyway, yes. you, you did you did drum up some yeah. s some fun. <laughs> well, you know the trench. You, Carl Reisman had, was the one to discover the Finnegan's Wake was full of, of of black African and Caribbean stuff, and he had a hell of a time ever getting anything published on it, and he he kept he's kept these rejection letters. In one of them. The, the main person speaking for why it had been rejected from the Journal of Joyce Studies said, well, you can read Joyce that way, but he reads better in English. <laughs> another one said, 
um, we've had enough new meanings of Joyce, don't you think? <laughs> I thought, my God, is this where the literature is going? <laughs> they just shut everything down? But anyway, Carl had found way deeper stuff than anyone else had because he connected stuff that was so strange that you say that couldn't be until you found out that you didn't know history. My favorite is where he's, he's found Rumbo and, um, um, Oh, I'm blocking his name. The uh, great black nationalist who had a sh steamship line. Uh, Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey, yeah. He converges these two characters with, with uh, several other people. And I said, this just can't be right. But then you read closer and you find out that, um, um, how can I make this brief? Oh, um, that Marcus, uh, and, uh, when the Irish Revolution started, Marcus Garvey was holding the, uh, what was it called, the Universal something of the Negro peoples or something like that. And he, he had them all sign a telegram to de Valera saying the colored peoples of the world back here in your noble thing. And this got into Ireland newspapers and so on. There was in the 20s. This was not some fantasy. There was this kind of convergence on it. Then he begins to get further into this and find that books, uh, ethnographies on Africa are being quoted. And they are being quoted in such a way that you can actually find the reference if you want to. And throughout, Joyce is dropping hints on how to read it, and often in other languages, such as wipe your glosses with what you know is one of my favorite, um, which could be asses and glasses and whatever. Um, but he, could, he only got two papers published in his whole lifetime because he kept turning them down as, as too far out. They didn't want to go that way. That's, that's where the, there's where the other side of that problem was. Lee was smart not to leave And Dell was so smart, he could sum up a whole thing at once. He said, well, you should be pointing out the fact that some people creolize up, as in, um, as in uh, Ezra Pound. Some creolize down, like, and I forget who. And, and some go both ways, like T.S. Eliot in The Wasteland. So, and he was absolutely right. There's some people who move both ways at the same time. John, um, you say in crossovers that you just don't like pure forms. And, and you, you, you've... Um... Well, I was quoting... Um, well, uh, with some approval. Well, was I quoting a poet on that? <laughs> but in any Did anyway, we see Williams? Pure forms go crazy in America? Yeah. Well, that wasn't but, me. But, but uh, well, anyway, you can read the script. <laughs> but, uh, but in any event, I mean, I think that, that you know, throughout the, you know, the body of your writing, you've, you've talked about mixtures in America. America is a quintessentially Creole country that with uh, the, the Africanization of the United States and that, that the... Um, that with African American culture, that it's it's absorbed and creatively worked many different influences, and you also talk about appropriation uh, in various ways, and and uh, you know it's, it seems like it's a some kind of current running through a lot of your writings about um, you, you speak about the appropriation of the the avant garde uh, contemporary artists in, in the in the early 80s as snap on snap off, cut and paste mm. as as a kind of a uh, false kind of a uh, synthesis, and, but, and then you speak about Car Sonny Rollins as a creative resynthesis, and and you speak about the genius of African American culture as appropriating, and, and and appropriation obviously is a is a phenomenon that happens constantly in culture. But it seems from your you know your writing that you 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 identify both appropriation you know appropriation which is creative and, and fruitful and, and misappropriation. And appropriation is you know it constantly recurs as, as an issue, and I think it's a pretty hot issue nowadays. Two, and I, I just, you know, just some thoughts about appropriation. When does misappropriation happen? There, I guess there are intellectual property issues and, and such. So just some reflections on it. Well, you know, I, th I was thinking that uh, the South, one of the things I remember as a kid, uh, a really important thing, is that white people are always quoting black people. Um, and these are working class people, <laughs> even lower. Um, Aunt so-and-so said something or other, and uh, as old Sam says something or other. And, uh, kid, I used to wonder, do black people quote white people? I know this, this is pretty rich. <laughs> and uh, they were doing, it, to quote Lenny Bruce, uh, somebody doing my act every night. Um, he meant police in the <laughs> stations, but anyway. Um, that kind of um, deep, um, what's the word for that? What was the old word for that? Intertextual? Or, it was hypertextual. Um, that kind of thing was with me f from childhood that 
uh, at least behind certain, in, in certain frameworks, you could do this. And I, I later found out there were all these dialect books. It was not just black dialect books, but dialect books. Uh, Joyce knew about it because he, he refers to the key writer of these as, man, I can't, uh, wait a minute, I can't think of his name in a second. Anyway, he's a writer who sold, who, who wrote poems in fake German, fake French, whatever Americans were buying in those days. And some of his books went into 40 editions. And they're jokey books. His most famous one is uh, Excelsior. It's done in uh, fake um, uh, in, uh, Chinese, what do they call it? Chinese English, it's got some, it has some name. Uh, it's Longfellow in Chinese. This was reprinted in all the high literary journals in the 19th century. Are these um, like macaronic languages? Like Chinglish. Yeah. Well, Chinglish? Oh. yeah, and, um, um, and I realized the country must have gone through a period, and then we had all those white people who wrote as black people. There were entire generations of that stuff, and it made it hard for black writers to get published because their voices had been emptied out by, by a minstrelsy on paper. But um, I, I realize that's funny. You brought up the uh, the Kokalicha stuff and so on, and, and it, you know I could see it happening in the Caribbean and um, in the, well, the Caribbean too, but also in, in um, Argentina. And you had rich accounts of that um, appropriation. Well, um, what was the context in the writing of that that you were talking about? Um, well, that's why I'm puzzled by minstrelsy. I don't understand it, and I don't understand why people think they do understand it. How can, uh, if you've not read my Billy Holiday book, there's no reason you should have, but there's a, a review from the New York uh, Times where a, a white woman, fairly famous, performs at the Lafayette Theater, the biggest black theater in Harlem, in blackface, and she's welcomed and cheered. She was welcomed, she was brought there, in fact, all black audience. And at the end, she wipes off the grease paint and the audience boos. And a reviewer said, we weren't there for a revelation and uh, this is disclosure. We were there to be entertained. And then I find another note from the Herald Tribune earlier on where some great blackface performer has wowed everybody. And he's, the, the last comment of the critic is, pity the poor darkie who has to deal with the real thing. <laughs> so something real deep is going on here, right? And the fact that um, NACP's first fundraiser invited Libby Holman, hot from a show on Broadway in which she played a black woman and her pimp along with Clifton, Clifton Webb of all people who was the black pimp. You've got you to know these people to appreciate this. Actually, they were in tan face. Let's be, let's be fair about this. Tan face. And they sang Moanin' Low. And she was invited by NACP to sing that song at their fundraiser. She shows up in tan face and gets letters saying, how brave of you to come up to Harlem and join us and be one of us. I think, and we don't understand this one little bit. And when uh, Charlie Musser published his paper on the fact that the largest audiences for The Jazz Singer, a film we can't bear to watch anymore, was packing them in. In fact, at some point in Washington, they were running 24-hour showings of the thing. Now, I've heard people make justifications like this that just are ludicrous. Uh, well, black people were interested in technology too, and it was an early sound film. Yeah, in the middle, you're going to go at four in the morning to see a film that's, you know, that's it was, about. It was the first talkie, though, wasn't it? Not exactly, but that's what they claim. I mean, uh, it was, you know, it's not even, a, it's only partly a talkie. I say it's Al Jolson. I mean, Al Jolson was a superstar. Why is it weird? All right, that's as simple as I can make it. Why is it weird for blacks to like Al Jolson in blackface when whites like Michael Jackson in whiteface? Is that, uh, am I missing something? It's a good place to stop for a second. I'm missing something, Because yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Only because I see some people litching in the audience who want to ask questions. Oh. Should, we, should we do yes, that, please, Robert? Yeah. Move Ch to absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah. Steve, go ahead. Just, just use, use the mic. Um, it's over there. What, ins what inspired you to dedicate the Alan Lomax book to the F Department of Folklore and Folklife at the University of Pennsylvania? <laughs> oh. oh, that's easy. I, I'm, still, I'm still burning with anger. I'm still, it's the only real hate I have in life. Um, I'm not as bad as Roger about Penn, but I'm almost as bad. <laughs> I, you know, I sort of pull, pull my collar up when I get near Penn and look around me and make sure there's not someone following me or whatever, saying, you have no license to be here, buddy, get off. 
we cleared the deck with you. We had the place disinfected and <laughs> <laughs> sprayed out by. By the way, by the way, uh, I, I for one was very touched that you would dedicate um, your Lomax book to the Department of uh, Folklore and Folklife at Penn and to Roger. Uh, yeah, well, that that's put Roger in a tough position, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, I, I mentioned in this, this book that uh, when I tried to teach a course, the first course on black anything at Temple University, and it was music, and I offered to teach it for free because I, I was that stupid. Uh, I didn't hear back from the dean of the School of Music, but I heard back from the dean of Arts and Sciences who complained to the department head who said I hadn't gone through channels and people were, were upset about this. That was what I got there. So I said, well, that's simple, okay, North Philly, I don't know. And then I, what was the next one? Um, oh, before that, first job I ever had, University of Cincinnati. I said I want to teach a course on uh, African American culture or something or other. And, the chair of an Indiana graduate in anthropology who once went on to be the chair of anthropology said it's a non-course on a non-people. And I, as I said in there, and the, the, this unspoken text taught by a non-teacher. So that didn't happen. But then move way forward to 2004 when I suggest at Yale, I'll teach a course on Miles Davis seminar, and it'll be the first course ever taught on a black person in the history of Yale. It was rejected by the, um, the faculty committee on this, including members of my department, because they said, for several reasons. One was that Miles Davis had not done enough to justify this. Number two, Yale didn't have, didn't normally have seminars on, on uh, single persons. I forget the third one. But um, a Brazilian guy, uh, no, Ecuadorian guy, you know, who's our, uh, at that point, uh, director of graduate studies, answered for me before I saw this, because he saw it first. He pointed out to them there were 37 courses being offered that year on single, pe single people, and that I had noted in my proposal that it would be the first course, and that I dared any of them to turn me down. So I sent the rejection letter over to, who's the guy who got in trouble at Duke? Broadhead, who had written about Southern things, right? And, and um, I never heard back from Broadhead. I said to him, do I have to answer this shit? And then I, I get a note back from the chair of the committee apologizing. So the, pr the provost must have beat him over the head. But if Yale in 2005 could do that, um, well, have you, did you ask me if things are getting better? Someone asked that. Are they getting better? I mean. Uh, well, we got the answer now, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, go ahead. Oh, Roger. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I, I think Kenny initiated this. Nobody ever said, you can't go that way. You, you can. shouldn't go that way in folklore, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, at least uh, within our conversations. You shouldn't go that way. Well, no. I'm, I'm thinking as I listen to John that all of this was possible because of folklore's flexibility and, and, uh, also, and sort of the open. But also a willingness to quit. I quit the first three jobs I had without anything else in hand because I was too stupid to think about that. And um, anyway, I was headed for some small Catholic girls college at one point, I think. <laughs> I've lost track of Watch course. out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, could, could, could we go back to Lomax for a second? Sure. Um, the big idea of Lomax. What about cultural equity? What about theater, concertizing, uh, field recording, radio, and all those things as a means to an end that was very large and global about Vox Humana writ large and, and consciousness raising as, as a, a practice based in theory uh, that uses the met, you know, canon metrics, query metrics, parlor metrics, all the field collecting. I mean, cultural equity, it seems to me it is a very big piece of it, and certainly it's, it's inspirational, not just the public folk force, but to all public intellectuals in some ways. I just wonder what your feelings were about Well, in fact, uh, I had a lot more in the back of that book about Alan's um, uh, attempting to um, redirect um, early PBS stuff and, uh, and, and pulling their coats to the fact that they were violating their own congressional mandates. They weren't doing what they said they would do, and they weren't taking care of local culture. I remember he was very specific. You can't tell me there's not a stand-up comic in so-and-so in, in o Omaha that you could put on radio. You can't tell me there's not a gospel choir in every major city in America that couldn't be put on PBS and so forth. And my editor said, you're turning him into a Puritan ranter if you run that many, many things. But he kept it up. 
Um, Bess was probably helping because she got him some entree to some people who, you know, we couldn't ignore him exactly, but he was laying out a critique of PBS that was very persuasive and very wise because he'd been through all these forms. And I remember um, um, he has a couple exchanges with Pete Seeger when Seeger went on um, Sesame Street. And he basically says, well, I'll reduce it to one sentence. <laughs> the, the animals are stupid and the people are all squares. <laughs> and Pete, Pete says, I think we're really reaching America with the, with the folk songs. And Alan's just distraught. Am I right with this? He's just distraught that Pete, is, Pete would quit the weavers because they were too popular. <laughs> Woody, on the other hand, quit everybody, including Alan. If you don't know this, he quit Alan's show because Nick Ray, later famous for what, Rebel Without a Cause, was producing the show, and he said Lead Belly wasn't, you couldn't understand what he was saying. So he's fired Lead Belly. And Woody said, I'm out of here for firing Lead Belly. And then quick, there were some adjustments, and Nick said, okay, we'll have the lead singer of the Delta Rhythm Boys, uh, Golden Gate Quartet, will speak as if he's Lead Belly, and then Lead Belly can sing the songs. And Woody said, I'm off to California. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, you're putting it, that's it, Alan. Um, Alan had been through all media, and he was, um, he was, you, you think insane to do such things like, well, you're gonna do the first high definition camera work in the United States, and no one even knows how to set up a high definition camera, or how to interface with recording equipment? But he would do it, and, and this Japanese stuff shows up, and, and you're, you're down in Mississippi, and everybody's saying, what is this? <laughs> Alan proposed, you know, you hear uh, very self-conscious and, and um, awkward talk from some ethnographers about m if my people don't like the tapes I might make, I'll burn them all or whatever, and that kind of stuff. But Alan had suggested and proposed that every f funding agency that gave money for recording equipment that was meant, or video or whatever, to be used uh, in the field would be required to leave behind all the equipment, teach the people how to use it, yeah. and set up something. And whoa, who's gonna buy that idea, right? Yeah. But that, that's, that's a concrete idea that's not about you run into a couple of activists who say, we don't like this, kill it, like some museum show, but actually says, give this to the people and do it. And, and when I saw that Saul Worth and his people had, were claiming to have done this, you, you may know the, the Navajo films. Yeah, and, there's some, um, you know, some dicey stuff there. Like one of the people had worked in Hollywood, you know, and, um, and they were teaching him how to edit. And I mean, why, why would you teach someone to edit if you want people to do their own stuff? Let them figure that out on their own. You don't say go edit it. Uh, anyway, and Alan, um, um, well, he's my hero, what can I say? On the other hand, you know what your human limits are and he didn't. And that's what he did. That's why I call him a genius. The, I, I've never met any other geniuses, I don't think. But I figure they'll all be very single-minded. They'll all be indefatigable. They'll all be unrealistic. Uh, they'll be inexhaustible. And they leave, um, what's that image uh, in that um, painting that Benjamin talks about, the angel of history? A, yeah. Well, John is looking yeah. more and more like a hero. <laughs> but but and, and I'd end Is that with a those, segue? I, I, well, I'd end with those words, but Anna uh, once oh, no, no, had a question and wants to make a comment. I, I just, uh, again and again in discussing Alan's work, I, I think back to our meetings with Bess and how she was able to translate so much of Alan's ideas into reality without, and smiling very hard about it. But she, she was, you know, she left machines behind all over the place and she took took recording machines into uh, strange places and made uh, what encyclopedias for every group that was dealing with with the assumption that uh, even if you couldn't understand the language you could understand it I mean language is to be understood you can hear it she also left political structures yeah in all, the, in all the state agencies oh absolutely well I mean she was a genius yeah. Um, 
Microphone. Two disparate things. One thing is that practical idea that folklore, ethnomusicology, or whatever could undertake, and that is to find a way to lobby either individually or some other way the huge companies that are appropriating songs and things that people do and making tons of money out of them. I mean, I can name a specific instance, but I won't go into the details. Um, involving the ethnomusicologist Hugo Zemp and Sony Records. But um, I think they would gain, they're going to continue doing these things and that's going to happen. So um, these companies could get so much prestige and uh, goodwill if they realized that they could become patrons of the world cultures. And so they need to be kind of, I, I think, a lot of people would say they don't give a damn, which is true. They care about money, really do. You know, will be. It's all about the, the, the money that. That's what. You know, some music publishers that I've known talk. They just look at it as a machine cranking out money, literally. Um, so, but I think there's a part of them that wants to do, good things. Alan knew this, and he would talk to all kinds of people that were unlike, unlikely about the ideas he had. He talked to cab drivers, he talked to um, dustmen, he talked to, you know, phenomenally rich people and conservative people. Like, it's really excited and saying, you know, you, you ought to get to, you ought to see this, you ought to be involved in this, you need to. And he did tell Sony and these people a long time ago when the, the small cameras came out and things that he wrote to them and proposed that they give a camera to every single culture in the world. But I think we all could make a difference in this way by taking seriously this idea. It's not a joke that, you know, to, so that's one thing. And the other thing is we should think more in terms of being also like Sebastian Salgado, who went and just did things <coughs> in the front lines all the time. Where are we when? You know, like Susan was saying just now, mm. when the people were migrating into, from Syria into uh, at the wall at the walls set up by the Hungarians, and we were not there. They were singing. Right, Susan? They, were mm. they said they were marching. You probably saw this on television. They were marching to Germany because the the trains weren't there, and so on, and they were singing. And if we can't get there, their relatives are here in, in the States, right? Yeah. And they're, they're in New York, they're in LA, and so on. Um, all these things that are really frontline issues that people like, you know, Salgado, I don't know if you know his work, he's an incredible photographer from uh, Brazil. Uh, he was always there. And uh, really looking at the issues of humanity, what we, you know, is really going on, and not like, so th the other thing I want to mention is this, uh, specifically, I'm sorry to take so much time, but uh, I'm preparing this program, The Global Jukebox. It's sort of an insane effort, but I, I really feel I have to do this, um, that Alan started in the 90s. And uh, I shouldn't say Alan. When I say Alan, it's Alan and all of his colleagues, his coworkers, his people that he he couldn't have done without. So, um, what I want to do with this, it's going to be sort of like an encyclopedia in a way of songs of the world. And we don't really need that because we have tons of archives that have digitized their holdings, even though a lot of times you cannot listen to them unless you belong to sex Y and Z or whatever. But um, the thing is, um, it's got to be more than this. And I would like to say that I invite anyone to work with me on this in such a way or, or help me or give ideas because I want to realize some of the big ideas that came out of uh, Alan's work 
in those years, the articles that nobody remembers anymore, well, who can keep up with all this, you know? Um, but there were some incredible things that he brought together with the statistical analysis of folk songs, dances, and all this, but the interpretation of these ideas. I want to realize them on this thing called the Global Jukebox so that people can see them at work, not in a, an article, because I'm not going to be able to write these articles. I'm not in a condition so, to do uh, that. Uh, Somebody else can. But there are lots and lots of things. For instance, there's a geneticist that we are working with now named Sarah Tishkoff, who's got all the, the most um, collection of genes of Africans in the world. And she wants to do an article about the the similarities between pigmen, pygmies and Bushmen in genetically and musically through see, Alan's work. So, sorry, Anne, I, I see by the clock. So, the, so that's all yeah. I wanted to say. I'm, I, I would like John to help with this endeavor. So, I'm asking him specifically to work with me a little bit on realizing some of these ideas in this strange world of media. I see by the I'm clock. sorry to take this time. No, no, I'd say by the clock on the wall, we, we have a the presidential address coming up, and uh, wanted to thank everybody for, for coming today, and, and especially, of course, John Schwed with his brilliant ideas. <laughs> and tre tremendous, tremendous uh, intellectual courage and generosity, which has uh, touched all of us and continues to. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. It wasn't as painful as I thought. <laughs> no.